Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com. And today we have a very interesting surgeon question and answer session with not one leading surgeon, but two. And today we're gonna to be talking about innovations in cardiac surgery, specifically the use of telehealth during COVID-19. I like to bring into the call Dr. Craig Baker. Dr. Baker, are you there? I am, Adam. It's great to be here. Thank you. Dr. Baker, you have performed successful surgery on many patients in our community, including Ken Hall, Robert Adler, and Elaine Pratt. Question for you. Can you quickly share with the people what it is you do at USC? I am the division chief of the Division of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Southern California. And Dr. Baker, I understand that valve therapy is a very big part of your practice. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, certainly it is. Um, valve disease is becoming more prevalent, especially as people are aging. Um, it's become a dominant thing that I, as well as many of my partners do. There's, as I think a lot of people know, four valves in the heart. And we frequently get presented with people that have one valve disease, two valve disease, sometimes even three or four valve disease. Um, so operations can be very complex. They can involve replacing valves, repairing valves, or saving valves in different capacities. And now let's maybe talk about um, what's been happening at USC with regards to COVID. Obviously some very big changes happening in the way that healthcare is delivered to patients. Can, yeah. can you maybe share with uh, all the great patients out there What's been some, one or two of the biggest shifts in your practice since COVID began? Uh, well, you know, one thing we learned, especially in heart surgery is, you know, your health doesn't stop and diseases don't stop. And at least in our field, um, emergencies and urgent cases present. Most of what we do, at least here at the University of Southern California, is not elective. And we don't have the luxury of stopping patient care. So I think the biggest change was really asking ourselves, how do we deliver the same quality patient care as timely as we have in the past in this COVID era, knowing how concerned patients are about coming into hospitals. So it really was all about making sure we had always had safe protocols. I guess I'd call them enhanced safety protocols to make sure patients could come and feel safe coming to the hospital, knowing that there may be patients that had COVID around this area, around this hospital in the past. Dr. Baker, could you maybe share for the patients out there, uh, put into context for them uh, the new processes or new protocols or new precautions that USC has implemented to ensure their safety? Sure. Well, obviously we have to look at all of our processes. Um, you know, like most places, we had to figure out how to run our clinics with social distancing. That meant changing the configuration of all our personnel, of our waiting rooms, of how many people we could see in a day, maybe spacing out our clinics. Um, nobody gets into this hospital, physician, caregiver, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or patient without really adequate screening protocols. That means questions and temperature checks at every point um, just to be able to enter the facility because we wanted other patients to feel comfortable that everybody they may be around has been through a screening process. Um, a number of us had had multiple COVID tests to just ensure as we continue to deliver health care that those are negative and USC instituted kind of a institution-wide uh, COVID testing for all employees so that we could all show up to work knowing that we were safe. I think the uh, sanitization protocols of our rooms changed a lot. We have really rigorous um, ability to sterilize patient rooms after patients are in there. We've worked really hard with our clinic managers to make sure that gets done. And then when it gets down to the procedural um, kind of things, getting surgery, um, we looked at our air filter systems, how much the air is recirculated, what rooms could be used for patients that may have had COVID and what would be used for elective. So we don't do any, we don't have any COVID patients in our elective cardiac surgery rooms and that keeps them safe. Um, while we've had other rooms designed with enhanced hip filtration systems and things like that, if we do have someone in an emergency, we can take care of them as well. Uh, fortunately, I can't think of one patient that had cardiac surgery that got exposed and converted in any capacity. So, you know, I think we've done a nice job with that. Great to hear all the things that you're doing at USC to make your patients safe, Dr. Baker. Now we want to bring in Dr. Vaughn Starnes. Dr. Starnes, are you there? 
I am here, Adam, and nice to see you. Yeah, great having you with us. So everybody knows Dr. Starnes is the Surgeon in Chief at Keck Medicine of USC. And Dr. Starnes, question for you is, should patients wait until they feel safe from COVID to come in and see their doctors and get treatment? Well, I think safety is a relative term, Adam. Uh, I, would, I would just urge patients that have a history of hypertension, diabetes, maybe had a past history of uh, TI or stroke, heart disease, all those things need to be continually monitored. I would not delay care. I would continue to see my physicians and get input into my care over those issues. So Dr. Starnes, if patients were to wait too long to come into the hospital, what type of risks or health emergencies might they face? Well, our biggest concern, particularly in the cardiovascular space, uh, Adam, is, is strokes, uh, maybe devastating uh, complications of high blood pressure like aortic dissections, and even cardiac uh, myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. All those can be devastating complications of delayed care. Dr. Baker, can you help the patients watching this video understand how telemedicine helps you treat patients safely? Yeah, it's a great question, Adam. You know, it's, it's interesting because in the pre-COVID era, we talked a little bit about telehealth. And I couldn't help but think, I get a lot of patients, for example, from Bakersfield or the Inland Empire, and they spend two hours on the road coming to see me and then the clinic time, and it's a whole day experience. And we always kind of thought in the back of our minds, there's got to be a better way for patients to get opinions and get high quality care without putting them through that whole day. I mean, by the time you have your clinic visit, come back for labs, get scheduled for surgery, you can spend a few days just getting to your operation. Um, you know, and as difficult as COVID been, it's really challenged us to put some of these ideas at the forefront. And as you said, I think telehealth and telemedicine was one of the things that really took off because of this. I've got to ask you, given all those efficiencies, Dr. Baker, uh, and the ability for patients to talk like leading clinicians like yourself and Dr. Starnes, do you think this does anything for the anxiety level of patients? given that they're getting to meet you and be with you in a way that wasn't previously possible. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of funny. We, we always talked about white coat hypertension. People come to your office, there's a tremendous amount of anxiety of nervousness. And I certainly think people being able to get a consult in the comforts of their own home or not having to take a full day off work or, you know, uh, be able to be at home on their computers while they're waiting for the interview to start takes a huge amount of anxiety away from patients. Um, they often now can involve other people in their families at that interview that may not have all been able to coordinate a day off to come to the physician's office. Now, anytime you put a new process into place, there is often friction, right? And so I, what I'm really curious to know, though, if you've been doing this now for a while, several months. I'm curious, what percent of your meetings with patients are done by telemedicine? You know, I think when, when COVID was at its um, heightened period and we were really trying to have almost no contact in the clinics, I think that number got as high as 60 or 70 percent. I think it's probably back down to about 30 to 40 percent now. And certainly there's patients that are close by that know how safe our hospital has been that know how much we've been put the effort in and they just they want to come in. They want to meet face to face. And I think on some level, the seriousness of what we do in open heart surgery and stop people's heart. At some point, I think that personal interaction is important. Let's go back to Dr. Starnes. Dr. Starnes, quick question for you. With telemedicine coming online in a big way due to COVID, do you feel like this is a compromise that we're working around now during COVID? Telemedicine is gonna be a new way of physicians interacting with their patients probably even more so than we were in in-person interviews. We obviously have to get used to is the, the social interaction, if you would, that we would have in a, in a physician's office. We see each other on a screen, but sometimes we don't get all the, the physical cues that we would get if we were together. The quality of healthcare won't change. It might be even increased. So I don't think it's a compromise. It's just another way we're gonna be delivering healthcare. And I think we can deliver health care to more people by telemedicine. Dr. Baker, there's been so many great stated benefits of telehealth 
that you and your team are harnessing to deliver care to your patients. I've got to ask you, I'm curious, has there been anything unexpected that you have seen happen as a result of this movement to telehealth? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, Adam. We obviously put all of our thought and processes into the kind of preoperative environment. How can we see patients about their problems, safely console them and talk about a surgical plan and then get to their surgery? We didn't really think through in the beginning what the potential benefits may be after somebody leaves the hospital and is recovering from their surgery. And I think this has been another tremendous advantage. Obviously, despite our best efforts to educate, to go over medications, to go over incisions and wound healing, um, things come up and patients have questions and concerns and ailments. And in the past, they may have been called and had to come down for another clinic visit or we tell them to go to an emergency room because these are really hard things to visualize over a phone. Now, our office, myself, my allied health professionals can connect in kind of a video live environment, actually get a feel for, is the patient looking to stress? Are they diaphoretic? They could show us their wounds and we can decide, is it red? Is it just a tape reaction or cellulitis? So it's really made the ability to even take care of people after surgery better, which is not something I had really anticipated. With all the great innovation that's happening right now with telehealth, Dr. Starnes, I'm curious to know, what do you see as the future of telehealth? Well, telehealth is gonna have an amazing future. Uh, for example, our lung transplant program has got a pilot program going on today, where after a person gets a lung transplant, they can be followed by telemedicine at home. And by looking at a PFT remotely, that is pulmonary functional test, they can actually have the potential to pick up early rejection. So even with a complicated patient like a lung transplant patient, you can communicate about their medicines, uh, reassure them that they're not having a lung rejection process. Uh, if they do pick up signals that they need to come in, we can relay that to them and do it in a planned fashion such that we don't have critical emergencies happening all the time. So this is a, a, a remarkable uh, uh, addition to what we do with healthcare medicine. Dr. Baker, do you see any upcoming opportunities in which telehealth might be used in, in another way to help patients? Yeah, you know, we were just recently talking about cardiac rehab. And I think, as you know, rehab is a great intermediary step for people not ready to go home. And they're actually discharged in, at USC, where we have an excellent rehab unit. They're actually discharged from the hospital. They go down to a different floor where they're readmitted to a rehab service. Um, and that's great. But there are a lot of patients that want to go home and come in for outpatient rehab. And I think one of the things we've been talking about is, is there a possibility to add telehealth to rehab? You know, it's kind of ironic. My, my son, like many people's children, are in virtual school. My son is now having virtual PE, where he has an instructor, his basketball and football coach are going through drills and exercises. Never would have thought about this before, but you could see now how physical therapy postoperatively could have a telehealth program where patients would log in with instructors and go through the right exercises. You know, it's in these really challenging times that innovations occur and appear for us in ways that we just never expect. And it's really great to hear almost about a new layer of virtualization of uh, medicine and how you and your team are so aggressively, Dr. Baker, going after this. So on behalf of all the patients out there, I really want to thank you and I want to thank Dr. Starnes and the entire team there at USC for all the great, that, great work that you're doing to help patients during this very difficult and trying time. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Adam, very much. And thank you for what you've done for patients. I can't tell you how many patients come in and see me after reading about heart surgery on your various platforms. And I think it's been a terrific asset for patients. So congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Baker. And as we always say here, keep on ticking.